Good afternoon, Carol students. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sunny Vu, class of 2012, um, certified registered nurse and anesthesiologist. And Sunny, I'm going to hand it right over to you. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sunny. Um, I'm a CRNA, also known as a certified registered nurse anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist. Um, and I'm here to talk about my job and to tell you why it's the best job ever. Can you go next slide? All right, here's a little clip for you guys. Hope you can hear it. So this basically talks about what I do and you know how I take care of patients every day. And it's a little glimpse of what I do pre-op, intra-op, and then post-op taking care of patients from start to finish for an anesthetic. And then this briefly touches on the training from having a bachelor's of science in nursing to working in the ICU to getting either your doctorate or your master's um, for this in order to be able to give people anesthesia. And it touches base on the 8,500 hours we have of training before we can actually um, do this on our own as well. All right, next slide for me, Julie. All right, so a nurse anesthesiologist or a CRNA. So what I do is I am in the OR, I'm in an operating room, delivery room, ambulatory surgery center, et cetera. So I can give anesthetics in a range of places and for patients when they're first born to you know, when they die. So it's kind of cool that I have a range of variety, um, a variety of places that I work at as well. And I take care of them. Um, the majority of my time is spent taking care of patients a little bit before um, they're in surgery, during, and then after as well. Next slide, please. Um, so in order to kind of better explain my profession to you, let me just poorly explain it. Um, so what we do is we also give like local anesthetics in order to inject it in the spine. So I guess you can call us backstabbers. Um, I watch people as they sleep all the time just to monitor their vitals and adjust any changes that I need to during surgery, change their, um, the amount of gas they're getting or give them pain medicine, et cetera. And we also pass gas for a living. Um, it's to give people certain concentrations of our anesthetic gases to make sure that they're unconscious and lastly, it's, it's what I do, I put people to sleep. So hopefully I don't do it for this presentation for you guys, um, but I give people a lot of medications that make them lose their consciousness in order to get them off to a certain state of sleep so that I can do, um, so that the surgeon can perform the whole entire procedure from start to finish without you know complaining to me that they're moving or something like that. Next slide, please. So with anesthesia, it's not just the kind that you see in movies or TV shows. There's a little bit more to that um, that you don't really see on TV or, you know, in the media. So I'll just cover like the four types that we normally use. Um, there's first off general anesthesia, which is the kind that you typically see in movies. It's where 
the patients is all the way off to sleep. Um, you won't really hear a peep from them. I'll put a breathing tube or some other breathing device in. Um, and then they can do the procedure from start to finish. This is usually for like our bigger cases. Uh, there's also monitor anesthesia care or what we call as MAC. It's a twilight type of sleep. So you'll feel drowsy, relaxed. Um, it's kind of like you're snoozing when you're sleeping at night. But the um, other thing is they're the patient's breathing on their own the entire time. Um, and they most likely won't respond to any type of stimulus, um, et cetera. And then there's also our other two types, which is neuroaxial and peripheral nerve blocks. So with neuroaxial, it's where we have the patient sitting there and we'll um, inject local anesthetic into their spine. Um, and this you know, makes them numb from pretty much the lower half of their body. And then with peripheral nerve blocks, we target a certain area on the body. So like a certain limb or the lower extremity and we'll inject local anesthetic into like our, the bundle of nerves. And we use ultrasound um, to see where the nerves are. And then we'll inject local anesthetic to surround the entire nerve. And then that way the entire arm or the entire leg is numb so that um, we can perform, you know, a certain surgery on it as well. Next slide, please. Um, so as regards to where I work, I mean, the majority of the time you'll see us working in hospitals um, for a variety of cases, we'll work with pretty much every specialty you can think of, but there's also other places such as the military. Um, you can go overseas and work in, you know, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, wherever, and do an, um, anesthesia as you would back here. Um, and sometimes you'll even take care of people like on the battlefield and, you know, have to think of certain ways to manage your patient with limited resources. So it's, it's different from what I've heard. Um, you can also work as a professor um, at a university. So you can teach if you want to. You can own your own business. Um, there's also people who open ketamine clinics for depression or those with chronic pain. And, you know, you can treat patients that way for an outpatient center. And there's CRNAs who work at dental offices. So what they do is um, they do sedation for especially kids undergoing dental procedures. Um, so there's just a little variety on where you can work or what you can do. It's not just you work in the hospital the entire time. Next slide, please. So how did I get here? Um, I graduated in 2012 from Carroll, and then I went to Kettering College and uh, did my Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, and I graduated in 2015 from there. Um, and for CRNA school, it requires a minimum of one year critical care experience. So I ended up working at the Cle uh, Cleveland Clinic Surgical ICU for about a year and a half before I started CRNA school in 2017. Um, and it's a three-year program for my doctorate. So I just recently graduated in May. And for the schooling process, we do a lot of clinicals. You have a lot of hands-on experience um, from start to finish. Um, and I also did a dissertation there as well. And then the last thing to become a CRNA, I had to pass my boards. So it's this um, fairly big test that you have to pass. Um, and then, you know, you're a CRNA. So it's kind of cool. Next slide, please. Um, here's kind of what I wanted to touch base on. It's the things that I learned in high school that still apply to me as a CRNA nowadays. Um, you use a lot of physics. So um, in regards to like radiation or fluids, um, I have to think about like what gauge of IV catheter I have on hand and how long it is in order to kind of see how fast my fluid rates are. So it's kind of, you know, real life scenarios that apply to the principle of physics. And there's radiation. So you have like the inverse law where um, the further away you are from the source of radiation, like um, in the OR, sometimes we'll do x-rays or um, some type of scan or uh, fluoroscopy. So you have to make sure you're at least six feet away from this. And the further you are away, the less um, likelihood you'll be hit with the radiation. Um, I also use math on a daily basis. Like when I dose my patients, um, certain medications, um, you have to you know, think how much the patient will need and 
how much I should use. And there's also like max doses that I need to know as well um, in regards to calculations. And then there's a lot of chemistry that goes along with it, especially using the anesthetic gases. Um, even just like simple diffusion of gases on over. So we have like our anesthetic gases that we can like crank the dial in and then it has to flow across the concentration gradient to a patient who doesn't have any um, anesthetic gases. So you can like manipulate how fast you want it to go or how much you want to crank in. Um, there's also microbiology, especially using sterile techniques for our certain procedures that we use um, to make sure that everything's sterile and that you're not contaminating anything. Um, we use anatomy and physiology, of course, on a daily basis. I can, you know, kind of look at a person and see if I can intubate them or not, or, you know, do certain things to them, if I can, you know, kind of gauge that from my knowledge as well. And then the last thing, especially, um, is religion and ethics. Um, I'm in a profession where it's kind of me doing things on my own in the room. So there's no one kind of looking over my shoulder telling me, you know, are you sure you want to do this or is this the right thing? So it kind of helps to have like a solid foundation of um, morals and ethics and religion in order to kind of back you up. You know, you kind of have to ask yourself, you know, I can do this, but should I or, you know, is this the right thing? Is this the best thing for my patient? Next slide, please. And then lastly, why should you join the best profession ever? I'm a little biased when it's this, but I, I love my job. I get to do crazy things every day. Um, and here's just a couple of reasons why I think you should become one. There's a lot of hands-on skills. Um, if you look at the top picture, it's an LMA placement. Um, and it's like a breathing device used for surgery for a general anesthetic. And you get to do this, put things in, um, the bottom left picture is an intubation. So I get to use certain blades in order to put a tube into someone's, uh, um, someone's trachea. And you just do a lot of things with your hands every day. You never really know what you're gonna get. Um, there's a lot of variety in what I do. Um, one day I could be working in orthopedics and then the next day I could be doing like heart ablation or um, doing a colonoscopy, stuff like that. Like there's you know, you never really get bored with what you do. Um, I also have really flexible scheduling. I can pick up overtime if I want. I can work either four tens, which is my schedule, which is why I have today off. And I can work like five eights, I can work three twelves. So, you know, you can have as much time as you have off or as you want off, or you can have as little time and pick up a lot of overtime and, you know, work a seven day stretch if you really want to. And the other perk of my job is I get free food. There's there's the lounge and you just get what you want. You know, you don't have to worry about, you know, paying for certain things or not having enough time to go somewhere and getting food. So it's just there, it's readily available. You can pick up, you know, whatever snacks you want on the go. And I guess the most important thing is I get to make a difference every day. Um, it's pretty cool to, you know, see how much of an impact you can make on other people. Um, especially since this is my job and like I, I'm used to it. Every day I put a patient to sleep or I deal with a certain procedure or surgery, but for them it's, you know, it's an important day of their life um, and they're nervous about it. And I get to be the person that calms their nerves either by telling them a joke or, you know, I can use drugs to make them a little bit more calm. So it's kind of nice that I can, you know, use the stuff that's in my arsenal to make a difference in other people's lives. And, you know, that's one of the most enjoyable parts about it. Next slide, please. So what questions do you guys have for me? Um, my first question mm -hmm. is like, what's the difference between like a CRNA and then like just like an anesthesiologist? So um, we go through different paths, but we do the same thing. So with this, I went the nursing route. So um, I went through three years of my bachelor's program and then one year of critical care at a minimum. And then I went to CRNA school. So we essentially do the same things. 
um, we just go through it at different routes. So you can also go through um, to be a physician anesthesiologist, you can go through like a, whatever program you want to in college, plus four years of medical school. Um, and then you do a residency in anesthesia and then we'll essentially do the same thing. Sometimes they do like more difficult cases or um, depending on what type of practice you work at. So the place that I'm at right now is a collaborative practice. So I work hand in hand with our physician anesthesiologists and other CRNAs. So I do my own cases and they do theirs. Um, but at some other practices, you can work hand in hand with a physician anesthesiologist and they'll do what's called like medical direction. So they kind of guide you in, you know, what anesthetic you should do, sorry, what you should do or um, kind of give you feedback on, you know, this is the type of anesthetic I would do and consult with you that way. Thank you. You're welcome. What other questions do you guys have for me? Um, I have another question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Like, I've like wanted to be an anesthesiologist for like as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And like when I've like talked to people about it, they always tell me to like make sure that I work at a hospital that has like good insurance because like mm -hmm. anesthesiologists get blamed a lot, I guess, when things. Go yeah. <laughs> True. Um, actually, one of the things in our profession is that it's always anesthesia's fault. <laughs> so yeah. I get it. Um, but as far as like malpractice and everything goes, um, my malpractice insurance is paid for by the company that I work for. So I never really have to worry about that. You can always get additional malpractice insurance, um, but it also depends on like the state that you're in um, as far as the cap goes for malpractice. So it's not really something I have to, I guess, worry about a lot. Um, usually I kind of keep it on the back burner. Like I know I have malpractice insurance and everyone does, especially going through school as well. Um, we have like malpractice insurance in case anything happens, but like it's, it's important to have it. And most likely any place that you work for will probably provide it for you depending on um, what type of contract you have. So it's always, you know, good to keep on hand and something good to know about, but not the biggest worry that I have. Do you have any additional questions or can I explain it further for you? Yeah, you can go and explain that farther for me because that's always uh, confusing. <laughs> yeah, so um, there are a lot of cases in that we do get sued for, but most of the time it's nothing, I guess, too concerning. Like there is negligence. I mean, if you're if you're outright wrong, you'll you know most likely get sued. But from the cases that I've heard, I really don't know anyone personally who has been um, sued or has had any issues with malpractice or their malpractice insurance. So as far as you know, doing everything right and you know making sure that you're doing the best for your patient, it's not something that I um, have to think about a lot. I guess. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Sunny, can you hear me? Mm -hmm, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so you had mentioned just now, um, it's not yeah. one of your biggest concerns. What yeah. do you consider one of your biggest concerns? Um, I guess at the end of the day, I, I'm concerned most about like, doing the best I can for my patient versus being sued for it. I guess that's kind of the, the line that I think about. Um, like, especially if I'm doing, you know, any type of anesthetic, I think, okay, well, my patient has these comorbidities, they're this sick. So what's the best way that I can get through this anesthetic without any issues? Or, you know, sometimes I'll be thrown in the ICU to do a case that's not where I'm normally doing like a procedure um, or doing my anesthesia. So it's kind of difficult um, in giving myself boundaries and saying, no, this isn't the safest. No, I should be in an OR to do this versus, okay, yeah, like this is safe for the patient. Or like even um, the other day I had a patient come in, he was in his seventies. He was a perfectly, from his, from his standpoint, he was perfectly healthy. But, you know, as we hooked him up to the monitors, we saw that his oxygen saturation was 
lower than what we were normally used to. He was telling us he was fine, but then was also complaining of chest tightness and, you know, all, it was like going down a rabbit hole and finding other things that were wrong with him that he kind of didn't tell us about. And it was, it was essentially my decision plus the um, gastroenterologist that was there to give ourselves the boundaries and say, no, this isn't safe to do the case right now. And then we sent him to the emergency department for him to get checked up on. So it, it's, um, it's kind of, you know, in the back of my mind, is this the safest way versus is this going to be something that I get sued for? Can you tell us a little bit about your work-life balance? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I work for tens. Sometimes I work a little bit more over time, um, depending on the day or how much they need me. But I get three days off every week if I don't want to work any overtime. So it's nice to be able to have some time off to relax, enjoy. And this is a pretty stressful job. So it's it's kind of nice to have that time off to step away from my work. Um, and especially this is one of those jobs where I kind of don't have to bring work home. So I, you know, get to really separate my life um, if I want to, or I can check up on my patients at home if I really, you know, if I'm really concerned about them for some reason. So it's nice to be able to relax and enjoy and have the time to do so um, versus, you know, worrying about work all the time. And then I think I have two more questions and we'll try yeah. to um, take some final questions from any of the students who might have some oh. and then we'll wrap it up so that I know you guys can get back to your classes. Um, so my two questions that kind of go hand in hand, mm -hmm. what is your favorite part of your job and what is your least favorite part of your job? Oh, I guess my favorite part every single time when a patient wakes up and they tell me it was the best anesthetic or the best sleep they've ever had. And it's just, nice to know that you get that like feedback right away um that you're you know that you're doing a great job and you can see it firsthand you don't have to wait around you have to question yourself if you did the right thing and you know sometimes you have a cranky patient coming in and you know they're they're nervous they're worried and you get to really like relieve all that anxiety from them like like that like you don't even have to have to think about it and you get to see it, you get to see their smiles, you get to see the relief on their face after um, you finish their anesthetic or finish their procedure. And it's, you know, really cool to be a part of. And probably the worst thing about my job is the stress and emotions that come with it. Like it's, it's not easy going um, in one case and like seeing a baby born and then going in another case and having to do like an organ procurement where you're taking away all their organs for donation. Um, it's kind of something, you know, I'm struggling with as well. It's, it's not easy to deal with life and death on a daily basis. Um, just like the other day, I started my day off with a foot amputation that I was scheduled for. And then I got thrown in a case that was an organ procurement. And it's my first one since I've um, finished school. And it was a 28 year old, she's young, you know, seemingly healthy, but got in a motor vehicle accident and she was pronounced brain dead. So my job for the entire procedure was to maintain her hemodynamics, make sure her blood pressure and her heart rate was stable for them to be able to take out the organs. And, you know, it's, it's hard thinking how young people are and how much they still have so much life to live and you know, to see that she's only a couple years older than me and that I'm doing a procedure like that for her. And it's, it's just wild. Like it's, it's something that's hard, but there's also like the miracle of life that you have to think about too. And for that specific case, I actually, um, we had time to wait for the heart recipient. So I ended up scrubbing in on that case and I was, you know, hands deep in touching her organs and, you know, in, feeling her beating heart and it's you know it reminds me how awesome this job is as well you know there's sad parts to it but there's also really amazing parts too um and then finally um mm -hmm. one little final question to bring you back to carol um yeah. what were your favorite things from carol what are your favorite memories 
Uh, definitely Pat's Retreat. I, I loved it. I loved leading Pat's Retreat. Um, it was just like a good moment where you kind of, you bring in your leadership skills, you bring in your um, teamwork and your bonding. And it was just nice to get to know everyone. And, you know, it was just like a, a good heartfelt high school experience. That's so funny. Back um, in 1995, when I graduated yeah. from Carroll, we just had, we called it the senior retreat. And to this Aww. day, it's still probably one of my favorite memories as well. So that's awesome to hear. Yeah, um, I love well, it. On behalf of somebody having been um, using your trade on multiple different surgeries, um, you brought, well, somebody in your trade brought my two children into this world because I had two C-sections. So um, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, being able to stay awake and, and just be part of that moment, um, you know, especially because I was terrified, you know, I didn't know what was oh, yeah. going to happen and yeah. being able to be awake and still be part of it and see everything. It was, it was awesome. And then, although I have my reader glasses now, I recently in the last year had cataract surgery on both eyes. So I had, oh. um, yeah, I had cataracts um, that started in my thirties and were taken out here just recently. Oh, wow. um, it was early onset, very odd case, but um, yeah, I, uh, it was amazing because I woke up with two brand new eyes as well. So, wow. <laughs> and you know, I, I had a lot of people will tell you, you'll remember things or you'll see strange mm -hmm. things and, I, I had none of that, um, both oh, times that they did each, you know, they did each eyes two weeks apart and it was easy peasy. And, and I woke up and I have the inject inserts in my eyes and mm -hmm. it, I can see now. And it's, you know, for 10 to 15 years of my life, I watched my eyes just get worse and worse and worse to the point that I couldn't mm -hmm. drive. So now I'm driving again and I have two brand new eyes and, you know, I have bionic eyes and it's amazing, but yeah, that certainly would not have been able to happen. <laughs> Congratulations. Staying awake the whole time. <laughs> Congrats. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm very, very happy with it. So, um, but we wanted to, again, thank you so much for your time with us today. Um, students, do you guys have any other questions? I don't have any more questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you again awesome. so much, Sunny, for spending your time with us. Um, I, I cannot thank you enough. You're our first speaker of the 2020 school year. So that's awesome. Um, Absolutely. And thank you thank again. You thank you, me. students, for taking the time out of your day to participate as well. And um, I think that wraps us up for today. Awesome. And if you guys need any more information or you're, you know, you have questions that come up, feel free to contact me, however. Absolutely. We'll make sure all of your contact information gets out and we'll also post this video. So if you know of anybody else who wants to see the video, awesome. it'll be online here shortly. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.